All right, let us begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I was trying to figure out this week what to start with, and I was going to go back to Mariology, but then I figured, well, let me just move on to the next part, and then we'll go back to Mariology later in later classes. I just want to get foundation set so we can then actually go deeper. So I thought tonight it might be nice to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. I right? talk about the work of Christ. Jesus redeeming us from our sins. He uh, obtains for us every grace and uh, by the gift of himself on the cross of Calvary. We talked all about Christology and the beautiful gift of Christ. And very soon we're going to celebrate those days of his death, his resurrection. And then we'll celebrate 50 days after Easter when our Lord sends upon the church his Holy Spirit. And as we've been saying in the beginning of the first classes, the Holy Spirit is a person. Right? We oftentimes get the picture of God the Father as an old man, God the Son, you know, as this younger man, and then we have the dove. <laughs> so yeah, we get wrapped up the Holy Spirit as, as a person and have to see Him as a divine person. He is equally God as the Father is God. He's equally God as, as Jesus is God. He's a co-equal person of the most blessed Trinity. And um, it's important for us to keep that in mind, that when God sends the Holy Spirit to us, it is the third person of the, of the Trinity who is sent to us and remains with us in the very life of the church. So we speak in the creed, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. We speak of the Holy Spirit as the giver of life, we talk about His work within the order of the sacraments. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us divine life, particularly through the sacraments. He is active within the church. We talk about the church being one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. It's the Holy Spirit that makes the church one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. It's, it's His presence that He is the soul, we could say, of the church, you could say, the spirit of the church. He is the gift of life that the church has in Him. And so, when we talk about Jesus, we speak about Jesus redeeming us from sin, when we speak of the Holy Spirit, we speak about the Holy Spirit sanctifying us. So God the Son offers Himself in sacrifice for us to redeem us from the slavery of sin and so forth. But it's the Holy Spirit who is then given to us to sanctify us, to make us holy. So the Father sends the Son, the Son sends the Spirit, the Spirit sanctifies us, unites us to Christ, and Christ unites us to the Father. So, remember back, I talked about the trinity of the breathing out and the breathing in, right? There's the breathing out of the Father sending the Son, the Son, the Father sending the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit attaching Himself to us, bring us to Christ and Christ to the Father. The breathing out and then the breathing in is grabbing us and bringing us into the very life of God. So there's a sense of, of self-gift of God to us, we unite to, to, Christ, to the Holy Spirit, unites us to Christ and to the Father. So love pours forth to the person, unites and draws the person into himself. Because what is love? Love is a self-gift of oneself to the other, but it's also the reception of the other person. So God gives himself to us, we receive him, we give ourselves back, and then we receive him. There's this coming into union with God. And so the sacraments are how the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And so I want to go through is basically the sacraments, but then go through each of the sacraments and the fruits of the sacraments. Because the sacraments are a necessary part of the life of the church. And so the Catholic Catechism gives us the definition of a sacrament. You might remember this from the Baltimore Catechism days, those of you who had the Baltimore Catechism. But the sacraments are efficacious signs. Efficacious signs, what does that mean? It means it does what it signifies. It's efficacious. It does what it signifies. You pour water over the kid's head in the sacrament of baptism, the significance is washing. It washes the soul. It does what it signifies. Right? 
So it, efficacious signs of grace, and now grace is that free gift of God, grace, instituted by Christ. And that's essential because the sacraments are not something the church came up with and say, hey, let's get a sacrament. How many should we get? How about seven? That's a good number. <laughs> it wasn't like the church came up with these, but the sacraments were instituted by Christ himself. And we can look to the scriptures to see where our Lord himself gave us the sacraments by which he would give us divine life. So the sacraments are efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church. That's significant. The sacraments are entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us. We receive our divine life. We receive the graces of Christ from the cross through the sacraments, through the working of the Holy Spirit in each of the sacraments. That's where we receive the divine life of God. And we're going to see as we go through and do a little intro to each of the sacraments, those fruits of the sacrament, we're going to see how we receive divine life in those sacraments. What's divine life? The very life of God within us. We were created in His image and likeness. And so we are created for God. And so the human person is only fully, completely at peace and fully reaches what it means to be human by being like God, by entering into that divine life of God. So divine life is dispensed. It's, it's given to us. The visible rites, I mean the rites mean the ritual, by which the sacraments are celebrated, signify and make present the graces proper to each sacrament. So what does that mean? So when we're celebrating the sacrament, we're in the ritual of the sacrament, the, there's a, um, they signify and they make present graces. The grace of God become present in the ritual of the, of the, of the sacrament. If it's confirmation, the laying on of hands of the bishop and the anointing with the sacred chrism, sealing with the sacred chrism the gift of baptism, confirming the original graces from baptism. It signifies it and it makes it present, the graces that that person receives. Um, they bear fruit in those who receive them with the required disposition. So you have to have the right interior disposition, which we'll go over. Okay? But they bear fruit in our souls. And we're going to look at the different fruits of the sacraments. I think tonight we might be able to cover three of the seven, but we'll see what we can do. <clears throat> okay? So we mentioned there are seven sacraments. This was only challenged, the seven sacraments were challenged in the 16th century. It was the first time the seven sacraments were challenged by Martin Luther. Martin Luther rejected seven sacraments. He kept baptism, kept confirmation, changed the understanding of the Eucharist, threw away penance, threw away marriage, anointing the sick, and pretty much priesthood. <laughs> so, I mean, he didn't, he, he had struggles. He, he was a very good theologian. And so Martin Luther began to challenge the fact that there were seven sacraments. And he himself could not see where Christ instituted them, and so he just dismissed them. Um, which is why, as soon as you step outside the Catholic Church, you no longer have the seven sacraments other than the Eastern Orthodox churches of like the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, they're in schism with us. They just, it's a division over the Holy Father, as opposed to the Protestant religions, they protested primarily, one of the biggest things was the seven sacraments. Okay? So, um, King Henry VIII wrote a document when Martin Luther broke away, the King of England wrote a document with his ghostwriter, St. Thomas More, on the defense of the seven sacraments defending the seven sacraments. Um, and then Henry had problems later, but anyway, <laughs> it, was, it was only 500 years ago it was challenged. So for 1,500 years, it went unchallenged that there are seven sacraments. Many evangelical churches only have baptism. Only have baptism. Um, so we'll come back to this in a, in a few minutes. We'll go through each of them, okay? So each sacrament has what we call both matter and form. Matter and form. So what's a matter for you? What's a matter? <laughs> matter is the things we use for the sacrament. For example, 
The matter for baptism, you need water, is one of the matters you need, and an unbaptized person. That's the matter for the sacrament. The form of the sacrament is either the pouring of the water three times over the person's head, or the dunking of the three times with the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's the matter and form that make the sacrament a valid sacrament. So if my matter is inappropriate, it's going to be an invalid baptism. I cannot baptize with milk. It doesn't work. I can't baptize with, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We just saw that big problem, right? Or I baptize you in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. And thank you for playing. Baptism must be done with either the pouring of the water three times over the head or the submersion three times with the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. That's the matter, the unbaptized person and water with the form of using the words and either the pouring or the submersion three times in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. So this is important. So you can't, in other words, you couldn't baptize an already baptized person because that person's already baptized. It can't be done a second time. So that's why we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Because back in the early church, there was a question, if I sinned after baptism, do I need to be rebaptized? And it was a controversy in the beginning before they really hammered out the whole understanding of it. They said, no, one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And so we put in the creed, that's how big of an argument it was. <laughs> you know, and after that, you go to confession. <laughs> after you baptize. But we'll see this later. So at Holy Eucharist, bread and wine is the matter, and an ordained Catholic priest. The form is the priest using the words, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. Matter and form is what's necessary for the sacrament. I can't say mass with pizza. I can't use beer. It has to be bread and wine. There's a great story of, um, I'll tell you the whole story another day, but in World War II, uh, there was an old priest who was celebrating Mass every day because he, he was in the um, Dachau, and uh, some lady in the town was a friend of his who was a pharmacist, and she would bake bread in the size of pills and fill a jar with, with, baked, with pills, well, bread baked, baked the size of pills, and a jar with wine, put fake labels, and she bribed the guards to give this priest his medicine. And at night he would celebrate Mass, which is simply be using his chest as an altar, as they're all laying on the bunks while the priests around him. And he would just say the words of consecration, uh, this is my body given up for you, this is the chalice of my blood. He just it was necessary for the sacrament because he couldn't get caught. And then it was a funny story that the next day he said they'd take the host and they'd go to the fence and he'd throw it into the garbage can in a paper bag, and there was a, a layman waiting on the other, the priest were on one side, lay people on the other, and a layman would take the host out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the garbage and give to the community as many people as he could on the other side. <laughs> so this priest was always celebrating Mass and distributing Holy Communion, even in the death camps of Dachau, you know, so. So anyway, matter and form. And we'll see these as we go through each of the sacraments. So three of the sacraments can only be given once. Three of the seven sacraments can only be given once. Baptism, confirmation, and priesthood can only be received once. You can get married more than once. Your spouse dies, or the marriage is split up, you know. You can get married a second time, or a third time, or if you're Johnny Carson, eight times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you can get married more than once. Um, you can be anointed, the anointing of the sick, as many times uh, as you are near death or, or gravely ill. Um, and you can receive the Holy Eucharist every single day if you like, twice a day actually. One has, once has to be at a Mass. And um, which one am I missing here? Uh, a confession. You know, you, you can go as many times as you like, as, more, as long as many times as you need. You know, just please, not in the middle of the night, don't call me that. Father, I should go right now. Well, I will. I'll hear your confession tonight. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the three sacraments only once. Bapt you can only be baptized once. You can baptize, you're baptized. Once you're confirmed, you're confirmed. Once you're a priest, you're a priest. These three sacraments mark the soul. They leave a character on the soul. So if I could see the soul of a person who's baptized but not confirmed, I would see the mark of baptism on their soul. 
If I could see the soul of a person who is your souls, I would see two marks, the mark of baptism and the mark of confirmation. If you could see my soul, you'd see the mark of baptism, confirmation, and priesthood. Okay? The three, those are the three marks of the soul, you could say. The three characters given to the soul. So, if you break it down, priesthood has, since we're talking about priesthood, priesthood has three levels to it. There's three ordinations which a priest could receive. Diaconate is first, second is priesthood, third is bishop. The bishop has the fullness of the priesthood. So although the priesthood is only received once, it's deep, but each time it's received in deacon, priest, bishop, which we'll explain when we get to priesthood. Um, but, so those sacraments can only be received once. You can't get reconfirmed. Well, Father, I know what I was doing when I was 16 years old, I got confirmed. I want to get confirmed again. Well, did the bishop confirm you or did the priest with permission confirm you? Yes. Okay. Did he place his hands on you and say, be sealed with the Holy Spirit and put the sacred prism on your head? Yes. Okay, you're confirmed. You may not have received the grace of the sacrament back then because you were in mortal sin and your little pain in the rear end to everybody. But now that you've come back to God, those graces revive. The graces revive. Or the graces are given at that moment they come back into the state of grace. So they don't need to be reconfirmed, you know, um, that they received it. So... Uh, they have. So, the sacraments, as I mentioned, are the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, makes us holy. The Holy Spirit conforms us to Christ. His mission is to bring us to Christ, to unite us to Christ, to make us one with Christ, to keep us bound to Christ. And then, in being united to Christ, to be bound and united to the Father. This beautiful work of the Spirit through the sacraments. Now, you may not receive the sacrament of priesthood, but that does not mean you don't share in the fruits of the sacrament of priesthood. Because of the sacrament of the priesthood, you're able to receive the beautiful graces that in other sacraments, right? And everything that the priesthood offers to you. So you share in the graces of the priesthood in receiving from the priest. The priest does not get married but he shares in the graces of matrimony and the witness of the love that husband has for wife and wife to the husband. It's a witness to the priest of Christ's love for the church, the church's love for Christ, but also what the priest is to be to his people and how he's supposed to lay down his life for his people as a groom to his bride. And so the priest, in one sense, you can say, shares from the sacrament, from marriage, even though he doesn't have that sacrament of matrimony, he does receive the graces of that sacrament, or the, or the witness of that sacrament. He's able to enjoy the beauty of it in the same, similar way as priest. A little bit different, but similar. Okay? So all that makes sense so far? This is kind of basic as we're going through. But I think we, as we go through each sacrament, we're going to go a little bit deeper, perhaps, than what we've been taught about the sacraments. So let's begin with baptism. Okay? The first of all seven sacraments. You cannot receive any other sacrament without first being baptized. When did Christ institute baptism? When he rose from the dead and said to the apostles, go forth and baptize. Right? Go forth and baptize. And those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Right? What does he say to us here? It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, I believe. I have a new Bible, and I like it because the words of Jesus are in red. However, <laughs> I have the interest using it. Um, so here we go. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. So it's a command of our Lord Jesus Christ to go forth and baptize. And we see in the Acts of the Apostles, as Peter is preaching, people are converting. And people, P Peter doesn't say, just accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you will be saved. He says, believe and be baptized. Believe and be baptized. Or when Philip encounters the Ethiopian eunuch, 
and explains to him the scriptures that he's reading, the eunuch says, well, what's to stop me from being baptized? There's water over there. And he goes, he baptizes them. Okay? Baptism is necessary for salvation. Those are words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is necessary. It's a key and essential sacrament that we are to receive, the grace of baptism. What's necessary for baptism, like I said, matter is water, and a not baptized person, the form, as I already mentioned, the pouring of the water, or the immersion three times, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Who can baptize? Anybody. Anybody can baptize. It's primarily the work of the priest and the deacon. In an emergency situation, anyone can baptize. My grandfather was never baptized. My great-grandmother converted to Catholicism, left it up to each of her kids to become Catholic, to be whatever faith they want to become, and all of them became Catholic except my grandfather. He dragged his heels until he was dying. When my mother arrived at the hospital room, she said, has he been baptized yet? They said, no, he's been waiting for you. And she called the priest. He never showed up, so she baptized him. <laughs> Three hours before. It's something my mother prayed for since she was a little kid. Something she would cry over. That her father wasn't baptized. And here God graced her with the gift of baptizing him three hours before he died. Typical my grandfather, slipping right into heaven. Because in the grace of baptism, every, not only original sin, but every actual sin is forgiven. Every sin you committed is washed away. So like, that's a straight shot. Right into the glory of the kingdom. Typical of my grandfather, doing everything last night. <laughs> so, so anyone can baptize. There are three forms of baptism. There's the regular baptism, the normal course, which is the baptism with water and the ritual of the pouring or the, you know, all of this submersion with the three times Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's also baptism by desire. Let's say you're Tom Hanks, you're cast away on a desert island, you have nothing but your, your volleyball Wilson, and uh, you desire to be baptized, you're dying, there's no one to baptize you, you die, you die baptized by the grace of desire. Perhaps you always had the intent to be baptized. Things didn't happen. You desire to be baptized. baptized. Um, there's no one to baptize you. You die desiring it. You die baptized. Baptism of desire. The third one is interesting. We call baptism in blood or baptism in fire. One of the two it's called. Baptism by fire or baptism by blood. This doesn't mean we pour blood on people or we set them on fire. That's not our way. <laughs> so this is, you're not Catholic. You're not baptized. Someone comes up to you and says, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And you say, yes. And they kill you. You die baptized in your own blood. The baptism of fire. Has this ever happened? It happened uh, about five years ago on the beaches of Egypt when ISIS, ISIS took all these 20-something people prisoner. Remember, they're all in uh, jumpsuits kneeling on the beach. Remember that picture? One of those guys wasn't, wasn't Christian. He wasn't baptized. He was a Muslim, I believe. And they went up to him, killing him, chopping their heads off. They got to him and said, do you believe in Jesus? Are you a Christian? He says, their God is my God. Yes. And they killed him for the faith. He died baptized in his own blood. He was baptized in his own blood. So it does happen. This... Baptism of my blood. It's an extraordinary grace that's given to people to be willing to die for Christ, even though they don't have the gift of baptism. How beautiful that is. So those are the three ways of being baptized. The normal, average way that you all get is the baptism of water, desire happens, um, and then also blood. You might be dying in the hospital and incapable of communicating, and you want to be baptized, but you can't speak because you're, you're, you're paralyzed. You can't, or, or, you know? And yet, there's no, one, no one even knows that you want to be baptized, but you want to be baptized. You die baptized. Okay. So what are the fruits of the sacrament? What happens when we're baptized? Well, first of all, we have the remission of original sin. I like to use the example, like if we were to pull up the veil between heaven and earth and actually see what was happening at baptism, we'd be blown away. The sacraments are so simple but yet, if we could actually see what's happening in the simplicity of that moment, we would be so blown away, we probably would not be able to stand in the midst of the glory of what's taking place. 
So the stain of original sin is washed away from the soul of that child. Washed clean. Secondly, an indelible mark is made upon the soul. So this consecrates the baptized person to Christian worship. They're marked, they're branded, kind of like a shepherd branding his sheep. The soul is branded with the mark of God. It's an indelible mark. You stand before God in judgment, and he sees the mark on the soul. That one's mine. It's in the sheep pen. Not the goats, the sheep. You're birthed into new life. You're given new life. New life in Christ. You go from the gift of human life to the gift of divine life. You're given the gift of divine life. You're adopted by God. To me, this is one of the most beautiful of all of them. You're adopted by God. We talked about this when we spoke about God the Father and the beauty of God the Father with each of the persons of the Trinity. But at baptism, we truly and really become God's adopted children by which we're able to cry out, as St. Paul says, Abba, Daddy, because we've been adopted. St. Paul says not an adoption in paperwork, but an adoption in blood, the adoption of blood of Christ. And so it's that beautiful reality that we enter into the family of God, which also it gives us the ability to call Mary Mother because of the adoption we receive. The Holy Spirit grants us those graces and we're brought into Christ and adopted by God as His. We become a member of the church, a member of the church at baptism. We're grafted onto the body of Christ, the church. So we begin to receive the divine life, the gifts of the Spirit through the, being grafted into the church. So if I take, uh, 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 you know, like I have no finger here, and I graft onto my a new finger, and now I have a full pinky, that pink and the pinky is receiving all the life that's coming from my body through that, through that pinky, right? It's receiving life. It orders everything else. It's united to the body. We are grafted onto the body of Christ, the church. Become one with it. We come to participate in the universal priesthood of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not the priesthood like my priesthood that can consecrate bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, divinity of Christ, or hear confessions. It's the priesthood of Christ of the ability to be so united to Christ I can offer myself to the Father, offer my sacrifices, my pains, my aches, my inconveniences, in union with Christ to the Father to draw down grace upon the world. In the gift of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, I offer myself with Jesus to the Father. It's kind of like when the old, if you ever want to see the old Mass, when the altar servants would serve Mass, the priest would hold up the Eucharist, and the altar boys would be kneeling behind the priest, and they'd grab the back of his vestment and hold up the back of his vestment. They were being symbolic of the people of God who were offering the sacrifice with the priest. Holding on to his tail, on to the coattails, literally, <laughs> of the priest. As he's offering the Eucharist, they would hold on in the offering as a way of saying we're participating in the priesthood of Christ Jesus. In the offering. We're infused with the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and charity are infused into the soul at the moment of baptism. They're freely gifted. That's why we call them the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. They're given to the soul. Now they need to be developed as one grows, one needs to mature in that faith, we study and so forth, needs to grow in charity by learning how to love and so forth, needs to grow in hope, particularly in moments of adversity, to allow those virtues to mature within the soul, particularly during difficult times. Faith, hope, and charity mature, just as every child matures in various parts of their life. But these gifts are infused. Not often spoken about, also at baptism, you receive the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. Too often times, oh, at confirmation, that's when you receive the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. You've already received them at baptism. In confirmation, they are strengthened, they're renewed, they're reinvigorated, they are, they're given extra life, those sacraments in confirmation. But those sevenfold gifts are already given at baptism of wisdom, knowledge, counsel, understanding, piety, fear of the Lord, fortitude. Four gifts, 
Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and counsel are given to our intellect so we can know God. Fortitude is given to our will so we can love God. Piety and fear of the Lord are also given so that we can truly love God. And one another for that matter. <laughs> but it's given to the will as well. So God gives these graces to the intellect and to the will to overcome the detriment we had in original sin. In original sin, our intellects were darkened, our wills were weakened. Well, we receive the grace of baptism, we're washed clean of original sin, and God then does more than make up for what's lacking by giving us an overabundance of His gifts of wisdom, counsel, knowledge, understanding, piety, fear of the Lord, and fortitude. In other words, there's no reason for us not to get to heaven. We got every grace to get there. I didn't write on the board, but one of the grace that's given at baptism is we are wedded to Christ. We are wedded to Christ. The two become one. Which is why we can call uh, every male soul, female soul, we can call Christ the groom of the soul. It's interesting in theology, in, um, you know, in Latin we have masculine verb nouns and, fe and feminine nouns, right? The soul, if it was, a, you know, technically speaking, it should be animo if it was a man's soul, and anima if it's a female soul. However, in Latin, there is no masculine form of soul. It's anima, it's always feminine, the noun. Because the soul, the human soul, is always feminine in the sense that it always receives and conceives the gift of God in relationship to God. In union with Christ, it receives the, everything it has from God and conceives the graces of God and brings forth life in itself through the gift of the living out of the faith and the fruits of the Spirit in charity and, and so forth. It brings forth its fruit. It receives Christ. It's a union of the soul with Christ where God gives everything the soul receives and conceives that gift of life in itself. So the soul is always animal. Even in the male soul, not, you have to think outside sexual terms, but in the terms of relationship of the gifting and receiving in that marital relationship. Which is why we always put babies in wedding dresses for the baptism, because they're being wedded to Christ. St. Paul learned this lesson when he was persecuting Christians. And Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? me. You touch the church, you touch Christ. Why? Because every soul who's baptized is wedded to Christ. You touch him. The two have become one flesh. The two are one. And later on he'll talk about marriage, St. Paul, and he will say, I'm speaking not of marriage, but of something greater, but it also applies to marriage. He was speaking particularly of the gifting of of each person to Christ, and Christ each person, which takes place in the beautiful gift of baptism. Also have room to write here that, very important, we're given sanctifying grace. The grace that sanctifies us is also given at baptism. We're given sanctifying grace. The graces that make us holy is given at baptism. And this is when, we brought, remember last week I talked about the four states uh, the five states of life is when we're taken out of the state of original sin and we're brought into the state of grace. You must be in the state of grace to enter the glory of the kingdom of heaven. Anyone who enters heaven enters in the state of grace. One is brought into the state of grace through the waters of baptism. Again, we cannot make that judgment of who's in the state of grace when they die. There might be an objective reality that this person's dying out without baptism, they're not in the state of grace, but we don't know what's happening during that dying process. Perhaps they're dying with a desire, no one knows that, and there's a baptism. So we don't know that part. That's why only God judges, right? But we do know that we need to be in the state of grace to enter the glory of the kingdom of heaven. And baptism brings us into that state of grace. Essentially why it's so important to proclaim the faith and to call people to baptism. To the waters. Think about someone not baptized, not having all these graces, what's truly lacking. 
We live in a world where so many people have not been baptized. Is it any wonder why the world is going the way it is? We've stopped baptism, seeing baptism as important. Any wonder why the world is going the way it is? You know? So that's the sacrament of baptism. Okay? Let me go over here now to confirmation. Why am I jumping right to confirmation? I was baptized, and then I went to my first penance, and then I went to Eucharist, and when I was in you know, 8th grade, ninth grade, 12th grade, then I was confirmed. Why are you doing confirmation second? Easy answer to that. Confirmation is actually the second sacrament. The order of sacraments is baptism, then confirmation. Um, I'm doing a wedding for a young man who is, um, is he Maronite right? Right, so he's Maronite right. So he was baptized, and moments later, after he was baptized, he was confirmed. In the Eastern Church, they confirm you at your baptism. You receive both sacraments at the moment of baptism. What happened was, that because the bishop is the primary person who does confirmation, in the early church, we had to wait for the bishop to come around to do the confirmation, so they began to separate confirmation from baptism. So you would do the, the confirmation later when the bishop came around. Then as time went on, it became, well, let's wait till they know a little bit better about what confirmation is, and so forth. And then eventually became what we have today, we're so far apart from, from baptism. I have a particular problem with confirmation being so late. This is my personal opinion. Um, because of the graces we receive at confirmation, I think it's unfair to send somebody into middle school these days without that grace of that sacrament. So it's no problem for a young person to understand the sacrament of confirmation so they can have them, them be confirmed so that they can have the necessary graces to get through junior high and high school without losing their faith. It's very hard when somebody has gone through our, our particular society to 11th grade to somehow now undo everything the world did to give them to confirm them when so much has already gone on in their souls, so in their lives. In other words, I think they need the graces of confirmation much younger. So confirmation, the matter is a baptized person. You can't confirm a non-confirmed person, a non-baptized person. If a person is not baptized, they can't receive confirmation. Why? Because confirmation completes the sacrament of baptism. It deepens and increases the baptismal grace. It's called confirming because it's confirming the grace of baptism. It is not the day I choose to be Catholic. Now, if I'm older and I'm receiving the sacrament, then yes, I have to say, I want to live the faith, I need to profess the creed, and so forth. But that is not essential for the sacrament in the sense that I can be confirmed as a child, as a baby. Right? So it's not, okay, now I'm going to be a mature adult and choose Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior and get confirmed. We've been teaching that since the 60s, and that's incorrect. It's the f completion of the sacrament of baptism. So the matter is a baptized person, and they need a bishop or a priest with the bishop's permission for the matter of the sacrament. The form is the laying on of hands and the, and the anointing with the sacred chrism, and the bishop says the words, or the priest with the bishop's permission, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very simple. Now, back in the days when some of you were confirmed, the bishop smacked you. <laughs> Why would the bishop smack you? Because now, you're going to war. <laughs> be ready. You know, be ready. Our Rodney Dangerfield line just popped into my head. I was so ugly as a child, the doctor smacked my mother. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Sometimes I have these comedy things going in my head. So... <laughs> So as I said, the priest can do, can do a confirmation with the bishop's permission. He needs to be delegated. Unless it's a person that the, bishop, the priest is bringing into the church, then the law of the church automatically gives the priest the ability to confirm them. So in the past year since I've been here, we had two people who were not Catholic, 
who were basically practicing the Catholic faith for years, decided to become Catholic, so I was able to welcome them into the church and confirm them, give them their first Holy Communion. Okay? The fruits of the sacrament. There is an increase and a deepening of baptismal grace. So everything we received here is now increased and deepened. It's increased. It's like turning up the volume or opening up the, the faucet. It's increased and deepened. There's a deepening of one's roots in the divine filiation, the divine sonship, that a divine childhood of God. It, it increases, it deepens the relationship with the Father. The Holy Spirit is able to flood the soul more powerfully through this sacrament and allow us to have that crying out of Abba Father. There's a firming up, a strengthening of the unity with Christ. We receive the unity here, but this firms up that unity. Kind of uh, fills in the cracks, you could say. It puts more some glue in some of the cracks that might be there. There's an increasing of the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. An increase. We already have the gifts, but now they're increased. The gifts of the Spirit. Um, we'll come back to that. So increase the seven gifts. The primary gift of the seven gifts given increased at confirmation is the gift of fortitude. The gift of fortitude is primarily the gift given at confirmation. So as I mentioned, it strengthens the bond with Christ and the mission of the church. In that fortitude, you are also bound to the church in a more full way where you feel more, there's more of an um, increase in the grace to be involved in the mission of the church. That's why we try to get the confirmation students involved in things going on in the church. Because now they're getting given the grace to enter into the mission of the church of making Christ known and loved in the world. Mission of the church. So here, special strength to do the following things, the fortitude, with the special strength to, one, spread the faith. The strength to spread the faith. Secondly, the strength to defend the faith. The strength to defend the faith. By both word and action, as a true witness to Christ. The third, to confess the name of Christ boldly. To confess the name of Christ boldly. That gift of the sacrament gives that person the graces to be able to uh, spread the faith, defend the faith, and to confess the name of Christ boldly. And fourth, to never be ashamed of the cross. To never be ashamed of the cross. What do we mean by that? Well, the beauty of the cross of Christ Jesus, and to be ashamed of the beauty of what Christ did for us on the cross, but also never to be afraid of bearing the cross, to have strength to bear one's crosses in life, the strength to be able to do what needs to be done when it's time to do it, the grace of true fortitude to step up at the moment and to be counted. Uh, I thought of tonight of maybe showing a, a clip of the movie, but I didn't get a chance to set it up. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I do recommend seeing For Greater Glory. For Greater Glory. It's this movie, true story, about the Cristeros in Mexico and how they rebelled against the government when the government tried to suppress their faith. And they show the martyrdom of several martyrs. Um, Blessed Anacleto, who was helping to work the underground and, and to assist people, and how he was killed on the rooftop, a layman. Uh, Father Cristobal, who um, was shot and killed in, in front of his church. Um, the movie they show him saying to one of, the, one of the other martyrs, he says this little boy is only 14 years old. He says, come Father, hide, run with me, you gotta have to hide. And he says, supposedly, I'm too, I'm too old to hide. <laughs> and he said, and he tells him there's no greater glory than to die for Christ. And then later, blessed Jose Luis Raiz, he will, um, his godfather will tell him to deny Christ, his godfather part of the government, tells him to deny Christ and refuses, and so they cut off the soles of his feet, um, telling him to deny Christ, he, he keeps crying out, Viva Cristo Rey, they make him walk to his grave with the soles of his feet cut off. Along the way he sees a friend of his on the side of the street as the guards are on his side, 
and he says to him, his friend, never has heaven been so easily achieved. And they walk him to his grave, and his parents are standing across the grave, and his godfather says to him again, just say death to Christ and you can go home. He looks at his mother and he says, I love you. Viva Cristo, right? And he's killed and rolled into the grave. Fourteen-year-old boy, beautiful martyr of the faith. He had the strength and the courage to defend his faith, to confess the name of Christ, and to bear the cross of Christ at such a young, tender age. You know, one of the youngest, well, not the youngest one, but a young, young martyr of the church. So this beautiful gift that, sat, that confirmation can give, and that being able to stand up for the faith, even at such a young, tender age. We saw this in the early church with such martyrs as St. Agatha, St. Lucy, St. Uh, uh, many young women of the church, you know, uh, how they gave their lives for Christ. It was the gift of the sacrament of confirmation, of that fortitude that allowed them to do that. Okay, so as I mentioned, confirmation also makes that indelible mark on the soul. So you cannot be reconfirmed later on. Okay? Now I should mention, to receive the graces of sacraments after baptism, one needs to be in the state of grace. You still receive the sacrament of confirmation, you're still confirmed, you still have that double mark, but the fruits of the sacrament, the grace of the sacrament, won't be at fully at work until one is in the state, back in the state of grace. So say some kid goes to, um, to be confirmed and he is in the state of mortal sin. He has not gone to confession and has committed serious mortal sins and is confirmed. He still will receive the sacrament of confirmation. His soul will still be marked and the graces though of the fruit won't be given until he goes to confession gets back into his grace, and all these graces will be like, whoosh, flood, will flood out and flush up. You know, and they'll be received those gifts and those graces. So after the state of baptism, to receive any other sacrament other than confession, <laughs> we need to be in the state of grace. You know? And again, the sacrament of, co of confession is the sacrament that's given to bring us back into the state of grace when it's lost. Okay? Now, do I have time for the next one? Uh, yeah, we can do something. Okay. Uh, the third one we're going to cover today is the Eucharist. The Eucharist. The Eucharist is the third of the sacraments. And again, these are the three sacraments of initiation. Or the three sacraments that bring us into full unity with the church. Baptism that brings us into the church. Confirmation seals the deal. And the Eucharist is the entering into union by the reception of our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity. These are the three sacraments of, of initiation. Why is it penance in between this one and this one? Because in the Eastern Church, again, they receive the First Holy Communion the day they're baptized. They're baptized, confirmed, and they're given Holy Communion. In the Latin Church, we separate it, we wait for the child to be aware of the fact of what, who they're receiving in the Eucharist, and we prepare them on that way, but in the Eastern Church, they can receive the Eucharist as, uh, they receive it as an infant. So you have little tiny tykes going up for Holy Communion, <laughs> because they've received it as an infant. There's a small particle of the Eucharist was given to them as a child. I have a fun, a nice story with this. Um, a friend of mine went to baptize this child who was dying, the child had um, some chromosomal disorder and uh, the parents were very devout but they were distraught and he got called to the hospital, he went in there and he baptized the baby and he had the Eucharist with him and the child was eight days old on a feeding tube, hadn't eaten anything and they had just removed the feeding tube because the baby was evidence from nine hours, you know. And so um, they named the baby Therese. So he baptized the baby, he says, well there's no reason why I can't confirm her, she's dying. So he confirmed her. And they says, well, she might as well receive Holy Communion. <laughs> this little eight-day-old baby, he picks up the tiny piece of the Eucharist, small so he can pick, pick up the Eucharist. And he says, Therese, the body of Christ. And this little infant went, placed it on her tongue, the only thing she ever swallowed, ever received was the Eucharist. And then she died hours later that evening, having received all the sacraments. And just the fact he said it was just so beautiful, it's like as soon as he held it up, she opened her mouth to receive, as if she knew it was Christ. 
you know? That's where you probably see the gift of knowledge given to such a little infant to be able to recognize Christ at that moment of her, of her life, you know? Truly a little saint, right? So the Eucharist. Um, again, we, in the Latin church, we wait till a child is old enough to discern the difference between mere bread and the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So the matter of the sacrament, bread, period, nothing added to it, no salt, no sugar, nothing added, just plain bread, which is why it has no taste. <laughs> the Eucharist has a, you know, there's no, nothing added to it. Uh, flour and water, that's it, you know. Uh, and then wine, and it has to have a certain amount of alcohol because it has to be wine. So there's a percentage of alcohol, because Jesus used bread and wine. We do what Jesus did, do this in memory of me. He didn't say take some cookies and some grape juice and pass it around, you know. Uh, in Protestant services, they will pass around crackers and grape juice uh, to imitate what Jesus did. At the, they, they're only imitating a, 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 a kind of thing that Jesus did. For us, we're not just playing like, let's all play Jesus and the Apostles. For us, the priest is taking bread and wine and repeating the words of Jesus because of the gift of his sacrament as a priest. He's transubstantiating the bread and wine into the very body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, do this in memory of me. Do what? Take bread, take wine, and command it to become my body and blood. Right? So... This is, it has to be bread and wine. I think I told you about that down in, uh, in Tennessee, so like the Bible, the, the buckle of the Bible belt, you know, with the Baptist down there. And uh, you're not allowed to drink alcohol. And they said, you always know the Catholics who's in the liquor store, they're the only ones talking to each other. <laughs> so, anyway, so bread and wine is the, and also a validly ordained priest. A validly ordained priest. When I say validly ordained, he has to be a Roman Catholic priest ordained by a bishop who has the apostolic succession from the apostles, right? So our bishops are purebreds, right? The bishops had the laying on of hands, of the handing on of the authority, of the laying going back to the apostles. Our bishops can trace their lineage back to the apostles of the laying on of hands. So they're purebreds. Bishops actually have a pedigree. They can look up their pedigree of who ordained them, 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 and they can go back to the Twelve. Because Catholic Church is great at keeping records. <laughs> so we have that, uh, that descendancy. That, so a validly ordained Catholic priest. The form are the words of institution. The priest must say, this is my body. This is the chalice of my blood. I cannot say, this is the body of Jesus, psh, nothing happens. This is the blood of Jesus, psh, nothing happens. The priest is speaking in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. And so the words he must say is, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. Those are the words of institution that are necessary for the sacrament. Necessary. If he fudges with them, there's no sacrament. So we have to make sure that the priest does it right, right? Says it right. So as they tell us, look at the book, do what's in red, say what's in black. End of story. <laughs> so, so the words of institution. Uh, okay. Now, what are the fruits of receiving Holy Communion? An increase of union with Christ. An increase of union with Him. The words Holy Communion. Coming into union. It's holy because we're coming into union with the Holy of Holies, with God Himself, truly present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Every time we receive Holy Communion, there's a deepening of union with Christ. Because it's truly Him, hidden under the form of bread, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we receive Him. And so we become like living tabernacles as Christ dwells within us so long as the sacrament is present within us for at least that 20 minutes until digestion takes place. There is a union with Him. There is the forgiveness of venial sins. Right? Venial sins versus mortal sins. 
So venial sin is like bending the branch on the tree. Mortal sin is you break the branch off. Right? You can bend that, bend that branch where it's not getting the full life at the end of it, but it's still hanging on. It's still got life from the tree. Once you break it, it's immortal sin. Right? So venial sin is forgiven at Mass. That's why in the beginning of the Mass, we have the penitential rite. We call to mind our sins, and venial sins are forgiven in the beginning of Mass. Okay, then we have the preservation of grave, preservation from grave sins, not of grave sins, preservation from grave sins. It strengthens us in temptation in committing grave sins. The more we receive the Holy Eucharist, the more we're attentive to receiving the Holy Communion, the more we're praying and receiving, the stronger we will be in the face of committing grave sins. We will not fall to them if we're being faithful in the Lord that way. Fourth, strengthening of bond of charity between the, the communicant and Christ. So your love, the charity, your love for Christ will be strengthened through the gift of Holy Communion. Your love for Christ is strength, that charity, which then, of course, in that loving of Christ more, you're going to love others more. Because of the strengthening of the bond of charity. And then finally is the strengthening of unity with the church. The bond of unity with the church is also strengthened in the beautiful gift of receiving of Holy Communion. So to wrap up for this evening, in just these first three sacraments of initiation and talking back to the Holy Spirit in giving us divine life, we see the work of the Holy Spirit just in these first, first three sacraments in trying to bring us to Christ, into Christ, one with Christ, and striking that bond so that will not be broken. These two sacraments brings us into the life of Christ, seals our life with Christ, and then nourishes our life with Christ. It's the Holy Spirit at baptism that is communicating the graces that are uniting your soul to Christ's soul that's allowing you to cry out, Abba, Father. All these gifts that are being, it's the Holy Spirit at work at that moment. When I'm blessing the waters of baptism, I'm stirring the waters, I'm pulling the Holy Spirit down upon the waters. So that through those waters, the graces will be communicated. The Holy Spirit is marking the soul of confirmation, giving you the strength and the courage to spread the faith of Christ, to defend the faith of Christ, to be bold in, in proclaiming Christ, to even stand strong in the face of adversity for Christ, binding you more strongly to Him. And even at Mass, the priest puts his hands over the gifts and calls down the Holy Spirit over the gifts. It's the Holy Spirit working through the priesthood that, that transubstantiates the, body, the bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit doing that at the Mass. So then when you're receiving Christ, you're receiving Christ, and that union is with you in Christ, but that came through the working of the Holy Spirit to bring you into one with Christ, to strengthen you in Christ, and to nourish you with Christ. So we're talking about the sacraments and it's giving that, being given that divine life from the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who came to us at Pentecost. Pentecost was not just, hey, hey, let's all speak different languages together with tongues of fire on our head. There's far more to it than <laughs> Pentecost because the Holy Spirit doesn't withdraw back to heaven. The Holy Spirit stays with us always to the end of the age in the life of the church and bringing souls into Christ, confirming them in Christ, and nourishing them in Christ.